Hello, everyone, and welcome to this Ruby Live event. My name is Chef Ken Rubin. I'm the Chief Culinary Officer here at Ruby Online Culinary School. Today's uh, live event are open chef office hours. These office hour events are really fun. It's basically a uh, time to have your questions answered um, and to uh, engage in any topics that you have questions about, anything around food or cooking or ingredients or cooking techniques. Uh, this is a great opportunity to, uh, to ask your questions, to have others uh, watching this live event as well. Um, express their interest by putting a heart next to that question, and then uh, we can begin to have some uh, engagement around it. So if you are new to these live events and you've never attended before, you'll see a area right to the right hand side of where you see me talking, where you can uh, type a question in. It says add question here. Click that black add button that goes into a moderation queue uh, so that Patrick, our producer, can have a look at it before we post it. Again, if you see a question that you like, uh, click on the heart. That will um, bump it up to a higher level so we get to it just a little bit faster. But uh, if I don't um, answer your question fully um, or I don't really understand the nature of your question, you can always, of course, reach out to us directly. So email us at uh, support at ruby.com or student services at ruby.com. And we're always happy to uh, to dig in a little bit deeper and uh, answer your questions. But I'm going to go ahead and just uh, jump in right now. Uh, first question is from Yvonne. What kind of chopping board do you recommend? Uh, I'll say that you know cutting boards are going to be a really important part of your overall you know everyday experience in terms of cooking. So when you think about the work of cooking, it's it's uh, you know a lot of knife handling, a lot of work on a cutting board, uh, and then the application of those broken down ingredients with cooking techniques. So cutting board is going to be really really important. Uh, I'm a huge fan of having actually multiple cutting boards. My, one of my pet peeves is going into someone's home or going into a kitchen and having you know one cutting board and people feel like they have to share it or you have to clean it before you can move on and do anything else in in your kitchen. So having multiple cutting boards is going to be important. Now, when it comes to what type, uh, I'm pretty agnostic. I would say that I use three types at home. Um, in my professional life, I also used primarily three types, although really two, uh, being you know the white or the the poly, uh, you know food grade plastic cutting boards. Uh, they can be white typically, or sometimes they're color coded depending on what you're cooking. Um, so those white, you know, uh, cutting boards, those poly boards are really great because they are uh, easy to sanitize, easy to clean. Um, they come in many different sizes. They're fairly inexpensive and so on. There's also kind of composite cutting boards, which are not quite plastic, but are kind of a composite material that are very, very similar, a little bit more expensive. And then there's, there's wood. So old fashioned wood is great. I would say that wood requires the most overall care and maintenance. Uh, you don't, never want to have wood soaking in water. You don't want to have wood, um, you know, go into a situation where it can warp or bend or, uh, you know, any of those sorts of things, which can compromise the integrity of that surface. So I would say really it's up to you in terms of what kind of cutting board or cutting boards you want uh, or what you should have. But I actually like to have a variety of types and, and sizes. That way, if I'm just, you know, chopping some, you know, herbs real quick to finish something, I don't have to take out a huge cutting board. Uh, so things like that make it just a little bit, a little bit easier. Next question, I've decided to try something new besides my usual vegetable broth and begun using Mushroom broth. It is wonderful and really uh, adds to so many dishes, even those without mushrooms. Can you recommend other broths that might be fun to try? So uh, I think it's great. So when you talk about veggie broths and the importance of broths in terms of adding flavor, um, I would say that the, the main two types of vegetable broths I, I make are kind of a classic uh, broth with mirepoix, carrot, onion, celery, uh, some bay leaf, some aromatics go in there. Uh, and then I do this mushroom broth, which is great. Um, that can typically include any number of 
different types of mushrooms. It also includes um, shallots or onions or red onions. Um, and just has a, a little bit of a different base. But one of the new broths that I've been experimenting and playing a little bit with has been a tomato broth. And it's kind of an interesting uh, concept because you can, you know, do a tomato broth with, you know, the standard kind of mirepoix based broth as a starting point if you want, or you can just make kind of a straight tomato broth, which is great. So the way I do that is I do a combination of some sun-dried tomatoes which have, to me, a lot of umami and depth and a lot of character. I'll also do some fresh tomatoes that I've oven roasted or done a long, slow oven roast on to have some caramelization, uh, you know, some heat on those. And those kind of break down. And then some other tomato products. So it could be some tomato uh, paste or some uh, pureed fresh tomatoes even. Um, and the way I build flavor when I'm building a tomato-based broth um, is by starting in a, in a hot pan. It can be a dry pan, or you can use a small amount of oil if, if you want. But um, kind of cooking off that tomato paste product, um, you know, essentially just in that hot pan, um, stirring that tomato paste is going to take on a different uh, kind of color and flavor. You're going to smell it. It's going to really kind of mature in its flavor, it's going to cook and um, be a lot, have, have a lot more depth, be a lot more dynamic in terms of its overall flavor. So I'll do that. I'll add my my roasted or blistered tomatoes, which again can have some color. You've concentrated those. And then your sun-dried tomatoes just, I think, add an extra depth and extra roundness. To that, I'll add you know some water. I'll add some shallots, some other aromatics. And then I find that it does really well with some thyme and some parsley. Um, one of the things that I always like to balance with a, a tomato-based broth is that sort of aromatics of, of the herbs and then the acidity that's coming from those tomatoes. Um, so it makes a really, really wonderful um, you know, flavor set that you can use. One of the things I find is that you can strain it out, obviously, and take the solids out. But then over time, just sitting in your fridge, it'll actually separate again. And the top of it may even be somewhat clear, um, but still have an amazing tomato flavor, kind of either clear, kind of off, off red uh, flavor or, or color. But that flavor that you're going to get is going to be really dynamic because you're not just adding, you know, raw tomato paste or pureed tomatoes into water. Uh, this is going to be a lot more complex, a lot more dynamic. Um, so Tiffany, hopefully you give that a try. The, the tomato broth has been pretty, pretty fun. One thing I'll just mention about the tomato broth before I move on to the next question though, is that because it's tomatoes, um, it's a lot more acidic in terms of a broth than other types of broth. So I mentioned this because if you're using it to cook uh, starches or legumes and beans, things like this, you won't get the same sort of softening or uh, gelatinization of those starches because the acid in the tomato will inhibit those starches from swelling and taking on more moisture. So I would um, definitely recommend not using the tomato broth as the initial starting liquid if you're going to make like uh, let's say white beans, but start with water, wait until they are um, partially cooked, halfway cooked, uh, that sort of a thing. And then, um, you know, add that flavorful tomato broth to finish it. And that's going to be a, a much better way than thinking about starting it with that broth. And you're going to be frustrated because of that acid. Um, next question. Hi, Ken. Is it better to store part cooked vegetables in a glass container in the fridge as opposed to plastic? If so, does it matter if the container is glass but also has a plastic lid? Um, so, you know, Ricky, I'll say that it's really a personal preference. Um, I think that in commercial food service settings, you're not seeing uh, glass being used for storage because of safety reasons. Primarily things can chip and break easily and there's a lot of weight and some costs associated with that. Uh, but certainly at home, if you want to use glass with a plastic or like a rubber lid, that's perfectly fine. Um, or if you want to use plastic, I think that's fine too. My my one caution against plastic is that I think people should 
be hesitant to add foods that are very warm into plastic. Um, and there's all different kinds of plastics that are designed for different kinds of heat. But I just worry a bit about um, some of those thinner type plastics and food that's too hot. So if you're at all um, concerned about, you know, the use of plastics in terms of food storage, you know, certainly you can use uh, you can use glass. Um, and that would be a, a good solution for you. You know, one of the great solutions for glass storage that I use are just wide mouth uh, quart containers. Great for soups and stews, and you can even, you know, because they're they're wide mouth, you can even store roasted vegetables or other things in there, and they they don't take up a lot of space in your fridge. They just kind of stand nice and upright. So, just a, another option for you there. Uh, next question here. Um, Hi, Chef Ken. My current pots and pans, Circulon Commercial, are too heavy to roll, saute, and are not stainless steel. Um, I'd like your recommendation for a good stainless steel pan to roll and saute in. Um, also, which Instapot do you recommend? So I'll start with the Instapot question. Um, you know, I, I recommend the Instapot. I don't think it makes too much of a difference which model you get. Um, I happen to use the six quart model that I bought um, some time ago. I wanna, I wanna say maybe seven years ago or six years ago uh, now. So I've had it for quite some time. I know they every year come out with new models and some have um, an app and Wi-Fi connectivity and these sorts of things. And that's all great. But I think that the core uh, functionality of the Instapod is gonna be pretty similar regardless of the the size or the particular um, kind of configuration. Uh, when it comes to stainless steel pans, I also have a variety of different brands that I know. There are many, many different types out there. Um, at my home, I use, um, you know, again, a variety of different types. I use all clad pans. I use a uh, Maviel, which is a, a copper, a uh, pan that has a stainless steel or tinned interior. I use stainless steel. Um, I use uh, pans from Cuisinart. Um, there's a, a pan company called Citrum that I buy some pans from. They're, they make a lot of catering pans and larger format um, equipment. Uh, I use cast iron from Lodge. I use uh, other sorts of pans that just to me have um, you know, multiple functions depending on what I'm using it for. So for me, it's really about, um, you know, what am I cooking in? How many people am I cooking for? And that's gonna be probably the biggest factors in terms of what pans I'm, I'm choosing. But if you're looking for a basic pan set, um, all clad, Cuisinart, um, those are all great starting points. You don't have to spend a ton of money, but you know, with the extra costs typically comes some weight and some quality. Um, and think about pans as being investments, things that you, if you treat well, a stainless steel pan, if you treat it well, you could have it for a lifetime. You could pass it down to your kids. <laughs> um, they could use it. So a good pan is something that, you know, I definitely think is worth the investment, but you don't need to spend uh, a lot of money. Uh, next question here. How can I cook in the oven efficiently on two levels and which setting should I use, conventional versus fan? Uh, for example, how can I cook a whole chicken and potatoes on two separate pans? What about bread loaves or sponge cakes? Um, so, you know, your oven has um, multiple racks, so kind of a bottom and a mid and a high rack typically. And I would say that, um, you know, if you're cooking things that require kind of the same temperature range, then you're probably okay uh, you know, putting multiple things in the oven at once. So if you have, you know, a chicken that you're roasting, a potatoes that you're roasting, um, great. You know, you can put them in at the same, at the same uh, temperature. You might just change your timing or, you know, adjust your timing depending on uh, you know, what it is you're actually cooking. Uh, but the big thing is that if you're using convection and you ask the question about just kind of regular, you know, conventional, baking or oven work versus convection. Uh, convection is going to give you a lot more even heating. It's going to actually also increase your effective uh, temperature inside the oven cavity. Um, so I'll just say, you know, it's not a problem at all to have multiple things cooking at the same time. You might not want to have um, 
something like a cake, let's say, that has, you know, a very particular or delicate flavor profile, you know, you might not want to have that cooking in the same oven as something that might create some smoke or some off flavors or some other sorts of things that might impart flavor uh, onto that cake. In other words, you don't, if you're making a cake, you don't want it to smell like the chicken that you roasted um, or to taste like the chicken that you roasted. Um, so, you know, certainly I think that you, you know, can just basically, you know, coordinate and find those things and the, the timing uh, for when, when you're going to cook what. Uh, but hopefully that, that helps you. Uh, next question, can you recommend a good chef knife set? Um, you know, I, again, I think just like the, the pots and pans, there are so many brands of good knives out there. Uh, I also use lots of different brands of knives, the same way I use lots of different brands of uh, pans. Um, I would say that, you know, really it just depends on your budget and the types of knives that you want to use. You don't need a large set. Um, most people use a chef knife and that's going to do the, the bulk of the work in your kitchen. So investing in that is going to be the most important thing. Uh, if you also look at getting, you know, a small uh, utility knife or a paring knife or maybe a serrated knife, uh, those are all great too. Um, all the big brands are going to provide a variety of options at different price points for you. So whether it's uh, Wusthof or Henkels or Mercer or Global or Mac, um, you know, uh, Kasumi, there's so many different knife companies out there. They're all making exceptional products. Really just a matter of what's going to feel good in your hand and, you know, what's the kind of knife work that you're doing? Is it um, just a lot of slicing and dicing? Is it a lot of heavy vegetables? Is it a lot of um, fine work? Is it mostly just kind of, um, you know, getting through like root veggies or what, what is it you're doing with your, with your knives? That's going to also somewhat dictate um, which knives you want. Uh, next question. Um, do you have a recommendation on good books that covers herbs and good combinations for cooking? Um, you know, I would say that one of the books that I love for flavor is a book called The Flavor Bible. And um, there's been an updated version that came out, uh, gosh, I want to say about five or six years ago called The Vegetarian Flavor Bible. Um, this is by... Um, Andrew Dornenberg and Karen Page, uh, great, great uh, writers in the food space. And I would say this is probably one of the classics in terms of flavor combinations. It's not just going to go into herbs, but also spices, other flavoring ingredients like vinegars and juices and things will also be considered. But it's an important question, the question around um, you know, building flavor. How do you make your dishes more interesting? What things go together? Um, those are all going to be important things. So check out the Flavor Bible. Um, that's going to be an important, um, important book. Uh, next question. When peeling onions, do you remove the most outer layer because it tends to be somewhat tough? Uh, would you use this for stock later? Please explain your routine for collecting, storing, and using vegetable scraps for stock. So, um, Carol, absolutely. So what I like to do is keep all of my ends and scraps and peels and things from my onions and carrots and celery and everything I'm really working with. There's not really a lot of vegetables that I don't save scraps from um, in terms of stock. There's certain things I don't put in stock, but um, you know, not, not many uh, items. But for me, it's really about uh, just having a system. So I have uh, a container that I keep in my freezer, which is kind of where my uh, odds and ends go. I also, because I make a lot of vegetable stock, don't just depend on scraps or leftovers or end pieces uh, to make my veggie stock. So I'll use those things to supplement my stock making. But ultimately, when I go to make a big pot of veggie stock or veggie broth, I look at what I have in the freezer and then I say, great, I've got a lot of onions and a lot of carrot tops, but I need celery. So I just I go to the fridge and I pull out, you know, regular celery. It's not just the odds and ends. So for me, it's really important to balance flavor and to let that be the, the guiding principle and not 
oh, what leftovers did, did I have? Um, but certainly keep all those things is going to make a great, um, you know, surprise one day when you open up your freezer at the end of the month and realize that you have a few containers or bags full of veggies that you can turn into a very flavorful liquid to make your rice or your beans or to um, make into a soup or whatever else it might be. Um, but I like to think that everyone in some ways has their own routine, but I would just always encourage people to find those ways to reduce waste. So if it's something that you can, you know, freeze and add to something at a later date, you know, might as well. Uh, next question. My dad got me a global chef's knife about six years ago, but I haven't been good about honing it and it's rather dull. Should I get it professionally sharpened or is that something I can do at home? He also got me a sharpening rod. So, um, Nicole, one of the important things to remember about knives and sharpening and honing is that when you um, have a knife that's dull and, um, you know, you're trying to kind of figure out what your next step is, a sharpening rod or a honing rod is not is not going to be the best thing to use. So, you know, sometimes called a steel or a honing steel or a sharpening steel, um, it doesn't really sharpen. Um, you need to put your knife onto a whetstone or a sharpening stone or use an actual sharpener to sharpen your knife. And you'll use the steel or the sharpening rod to hone the blade. In other words, basically straighten the very, very, very end of that blade, um, you know, where it makes the point so that you have the metal basically lined up at that very, very edge to be, to kind of maintain the edge. But if it really is dull, you're going to want to have that sharpened. You can do that at home, um, you know, using a whetstone or a, a tri stone or an actual electric knife sharpener uh, or have it professionally sharpened. And then you can maintain it easier with that sharpening rod uh, that steel at home. Uh, hopefully that helps you. Uh, next question from Darlene. Hi, Chef Ken. Any suggestions on using my instant pot? I have the small one. I'm a little intimidated by it. <clears throat> um, so Darlene, I'm not sure how, what the size is on the small one. My guess is probably a four quart, um, which is perfectly fine. That's going to produce a lot of food for someone. Um, there's nothing to be scared by. The first thing I'll say is that you know, it used to be that when you talked about pressure cookers and things that did pressure cooking, that there would be a lot of reason to be scared because, um, you know, pressure cookers on a stovetop, if they're not made well or if they're left there and forgotten about uh, or the valve doesn't work, can certainly explode. And I've, I've, um, I, I've heard stories and I've actually seen that happen. Um, so it can be very, very dangerous. I would say that Instant Pots and you know, the vast majority of other, you know, multi-cookers out there that include a pressure cooking function from a technological point of view have just gotten to be so good and so much safer than what those old uh, pressure cookers used to be. So that's my first, I guess, piece of information is, you know, don't be intimidated on the fear factor um, because they're going to be a lot safer than previous type pressure cooking. Now, when it comes to just using it, I would say just start simple. And um, most of the time when I use my Instant Pot, it's just to do a pressure cooking function. That's probably what I do mostly with it. And depending on what you're pressure cooking, you might just need to experiment a bit with your cooking times. But it came with a, a guide, a, a cookbook of sorts. And I would just start with those with those numbers and kind of follow their guidelines. And you just want to be really patient when you bring things up to pressure and they're cooking, um, you know, when they're all <clears throat> cooking inside that pressurized vessel, some people have a tendency to want to look inside and this sort of thing. And you just have to step back and say, you know what, we're going to let it pressure cook for the full 14 minutes. We're going to let it turn off. We're going to let it naturally cool down. Then we're going to vent it. Then we're going to open it safely. We're not going to play this game of, constantly peekaboo and go inside because it's just going to frustrate you, potentially be unsafe with opening and closing and that sort of thing. But ultimately, you just have to let it do its do its job. Um, and again, the guidelines that I find that come with the Instant Pot are pretty good in terms of the timing, the, you know, here's how long it takes to cook certain sorts of things. Um, 
Next question, with cooking whole food plant-based meals, can you use wine and salt to enhance the flavor of foods? Um, you know, I would say that the, um, that the whole food plant-based approach is generally going to limit the use of salt or just have some mindfulness around salt consumption. Certainly in terms of um, forks over knives or work that we do with the Plantrition Project. And when you're talking about um, supporting disease reversal type approaches, uh, you know, limiting those things is gonna be really, really important. Uh, when it comes to wine, I think this is very much a personal preference. If you're using wine, Primarily for cooking and for adding flavor, you'll find that it's a great way to boost flavor, to add um, acidity and depth, and it just is going to add a lot of opportunities for flavor development that you won't find in either vinegar or uh, juices or combinations of those things. Um, so I think I just think it's up to you. You want to be mindful of your of your consumption, obviously, of alcohol, but if you're using it for cooking and for flavor development. Uh, could be great. I, I tend to cook a lot uh, with sherry. I like marsala as well, as long as it's not sweet. Um, and then, you know, using wines and things for reducing. But one of my favorite dishes that I make is a, is a, is a mushroom dish with um, cremini mushrooms and sherry and thyme and uh, just delicious. You basically just, um, you know, reduce your sherry a bit um and add sauteed mushrooms and just kind of let it cook it's just a nice combination sauteed mushrooms with some reduced sherry uh this may be too big of a topic but can you summarize the process for fermenting vegetables at home is there a risk for bad bacteria to grow um yeah it's a big question carol for sure um you know i would say in short um the process for fermenting vegetables at home is is pretty simple. And I would say that while there's books and websites and blogs and everything else about fermenting, and there's a lot of details and a lot of how-tos and things, I would say the baseline process is actually very, very straightforward. Um, and essentially what you're doing when you're doing uh, fermenting or uh, lacto-fermentation, what we call it, pickling, uh, proper pickling versus a, a vinegar pickle. Um, you know, and lacto-fermentation is essentially how you make old-fashioned pickles. It's how you make sauerkraut, kimchi. It's the same basic process. Um, so you can certainly do it at home. What you need uh, are some jars or some containers, essentially a crock, to do your fermenting in. I use um, half gallon glass canning containers, um, or you can use quart containers or pint containers, whatever sizes, but I tend to do larger format uh, fermentation. Um, and you need your vegetables and you need water and salt. And the basic rule of thumb for fermenting, and again, there's variation here, is you wanna have for most applications, two to 3% salinity by weight. So having a scale is really useful here. In other words, if you took out a scale and you measured out um, you know, 1,000 milliliters of water, a, a full liter, which is just a little bit more than a, a quart, you would wanna have um, between two and 3% salinity. So if you had 1,000 milliliters, um, you'd wanna have uh, 20 milliliters of salt. So you wanna have basically two grams of salt uh, for every 100 grams of water. So, um, or, or 20 grams of salt. So the, the whole thing is, is basically easier by weight. But if you're not interested in doing by weight, my typical kind of go-to, you know, eyeball fake it um, with being less precise is to use between one and two tablespoons of salt per quart of water. So a tablespoon of salt weighs roughly 20 grams and a quart of water is a little bit under a thousand milliliters. So it's basically um, just your way, your quick way of getting to, uh, you know, per tablespoon, 2% uh, solution. So if you did a, 
you know, one tablespoon, it'd be about 2%, one and a half tablespoons, about 3% solution. Somewhere in, in there is gonna be your ideal salinity for brine. Now you can do other types of brining solutions. Sometimes if I'm just trying to break vegetables down as an initial kind of step, I'll actually apply a stronger brine, maybe a 4% or a 5% brine, just because it helps to break apart the vegetables. And then I'll still do the ferment, the proper ferment in a, a lower salinity uh, liquid. Um, the salt basically is the part of the equation that helps to inhibit the growth of bacteria. So what you're doing with lactofermentation is essentially you're balancing um, you know, what's happening with the food being preserved, but also keeping it at the edge of, you know, kind of going bad. It's kind of a way to present, you know, prevent spoilage, but still preserve the, the food. So if you were to take your vegetables and just put it in water without salt, they're just going to get soggy and mushy and grow mold or yeast. But by adding the salt, you're inhibiting just enough of the bacterial growth and creating the space for these beneficial bacteria, these lactobacillus and others uh, to occupy that space to begin to transform it. And you'll actually see development of carbon dioxide and development of all these compounds that are gonna make it kind of a little bit fizzy, make it flavorful, give it that tang that you want from uh, sauerkraut or pickles or, or kimchi. Um, so Carol, a great book um, is The Art of Fermentation or really anything by the author uh, Sandor Katz. He's um, one of the great authorities on, on fermentation and um, yeah, just a, a big, big space to, to dive into. But I think at the surface level, just keeping it very basic, you know, one tablespoon of salt per quart of water for your vegetables. Uh, is going to be a great starting point for most for most people. Uh, next question here: What is the best way to make fresh herbs last? Um, gosh, you know it, it depends on what it is. Certain herbs like to be wrapped in uh, just a, a cloth, uh, just a, a clean towel. Uh, it could be a paper towel or a, a cotton cloth towel. So just loosely wrapping. Um, and just a very, very uh, lightly dampened cloth can be uh, you know, um, appropriate for some types of herbs. Other types of herbs do really well in water. So keeping hydrated and staying fresh that way. But I would say the, the biggest thing is just to make sure that, you know, whatever herbs you're using, if they're something like a cilantro, which is more delicate uh, than even parsley, that it's being stored well, it's not being crammed or jammed into something and that it has plenty of room to breathe. You want it to kind of maintain a moist environment. You don't want to dry it out, but you don't want it to have it be so moist that you've got a lot of you know, water on leaf contact, which can create, you know, that kind of pond like or kind of green slimy <laughs> uh, sort of situation. Uh, so that's going to be really important just to uh, keep them dry, keep good uh, airflow through them. Next question from Rosalind. Hi, Ken. If a uh, good quality chef knife is honed regularly and kept sharpened, how long can a knife last? Um, you know, many, many years. I have um, a knife that I've been using for 25 years that I still use. And it's been... Um, Oh, it hasn't always been handled well. I'll say I use it when I was very young and, and things like that. But I'll say that, um, you know, proper honing, proper handling, you will be over time, you know, wearing away metal. So you are actually making your knife just a little bit smaller every time you properly sharpen it. Um, so over time, your knife can become a little bit uh, less tall, but you're talking about years and decades of, of sharpening and, and honing. Um, you'll sometimes see, you know, very, very old knives that have been used for, for decades where you can just see a little bit of inconsistency in the shape of the blade because of how it's been honed and maintained over time, or even just kind of how it's been worn over time. 
uh, but years and years. Uh, next question. Hello, Chef Ken. I'm tickled to be in the pro course, and here's my question. Um, is this June 8th event specific to the professional plant-based course or general to all Ruby plant-based courses? Uh, so this is actually open to lots and lots of courses. Um, we have many different types of courses that we offer here at Ruby. So my office, hours, my office hours tend to be open for really any type of student. So you'll see students of many different uh, backgrounds and types of uh, educational uh, pathways with us here in these live events. Uh, next question for Monica. I keep hearing about arsenic and brown rice. Are there safer types, brands, regions of rice to consume? You know, I've seen Monica, so much conflicting information about this. Um, some of the areas that you would expect to have, you know, clean production, no arsenic, um, you know, better water sources, these sorts of things, um, were not necessarily those places. So I would say the best thing to do if you're at all worried about arsenic and brown rice would be number one, to, to limit your intake of that, if that's a, a concern for you. Um, also know that one of the methods that I've read about for reducing the arsenic in brown rice is um, a cooking method that we kind of call the pasta method or the boiling method for rice, which is essentially cooking it in a lot more water than it needs and then draining it versus cooking it in a small amount of water and having it absorb all the liquid. So in other words, by cooking it like pasta, and draining the water, you're essentially um, able to reduce your arsenic intake because uh, the arsenic is being drained away with that water. Uh, so th just some suggestions. I would say if you know you're really concerned about it, there's lots of other grains to eat. Um, and uh, yeah, just maybe not uh, the best option for you. Uh, next question, I have some walnuts stored in the freezer. Uh, they have an odd flavor, like they have absorbed some odors from other stored items in the freezer. Um, if I cook an oatmeal, it seems to help. What do you recommend to help the flavor? Should I toast them? So Sandra, um, I want to say that your, your walnuts maybe are rancid. Um, and typically they don't go rancid in the freezer, but they can be rancid before they even get to your freezer in some cases. So you know, when you're buying um, nuts and seeds, the oils in them um, are perishable. They actually can go bad. And when they go bad, um, they'll have an off flavor. And sometimes it's really apparent and you can actually kind of feel it. It has a physical feeling in your mouth. And sometimes it just sort of tastes bad. Uh, but that's what I suspect. I suspect that your walnuts maybe have gone a little bit rancid um, which makes it taste not like themselves, which is maybe why you think that they absorb some flavors. They also could have absorbed some flavors as well in your freezer, but that's probably not as not as common in terms of um, nuts or seeds um, seeming off. Now in your oatmeal, you can cover up those flavors with raisins and brown sugar, whatever else you wanna do in there. Um, so maybe it does help, but otherwise I would just say, um, you know, probably better to buy fresh fresh walnuts. Um, it'll make your life uh, a lot more flavorful, I think, in those respects. Um, toasting them is not going to help them if they're truly rancid. So I'm sorry about that. Uh, I just finished the roasted vegetable section of the training. Can you make a suggestion for the best way to make basic roasted peppers without oil? So Carla, the best way to do that is to um, take your peppers and if you have a grill, outdoor grill, or even just over a direct flame in your home, uh, take your long tongs, metal tongs, heat proof tongs, and hold that pepper either over the grill, grate, and let it get nice and blistered, or over the direct flame um, of your stovetop burner. And you know, you want to fully blister and get nice black speckles all over uh, that pepper. And then when you have heated that pepper up and you've got that speckled blistered skin all over, you wanna put that into a bowl and cover it and let it steam. And that steaming process will do two things. Number one, it'll, it'll let it um, kind of finish its job of cooking and help separate the skin from that meaty flesh, from the actual flesh of the pepper. 
and you're going to want to peel the skin off so it's going to be a lot easier when it's been blistered um, and, and cooked a bit. Um, second, when you take that pepper off uh, the grill or off the burner, it's going to be really, really hot. So you're also going to want to let it cool down even though you're insulating it by letting it steam a bit. So let them grill, uh, char them up, put them in a bowl, let them steam for 20 or 30 minutes. Um, they'll cool down during that time so that you can then peel them um, and you know discard the skins and the seeds from the interior. Uh, that's probably the the best way to do it. Uh, absent, um, you know, rubbing them in oil and putting them in in, in the oven. Uh, next question: How do you store your dried beans and grains? Um, is there a sealed container you recommend? Uh, Monica, I'm pretty simple with this stuff. I use um, a type of food service storage container called Cambro. It's a brand name, Cambro, C-A-M-B-R-O. Cambro makes really large format food safe plastic storage. So I have um, large bins of, of beans and grains and things that I keep. Some grains that I keep, um, I'll keep in the freezer um, depending on what they are and other grains I'm perfectly happy keeping out depending on what they are and how quickly I'm moving through them. But my beans, I don't keep in the freezer, but I, I keep, typically keep those in um, 12 and 18 quart containers. I have very large uh, plastic bins where I stack up all my legumes and my beans and lentils and various things. Um, it's mostly because I'm buying in 10 and 20 pound um, packs typically for some, for some of those things. Um, hello, Chef Ken. I bought a blue steel crepe pan made in France. Uh, after seasoning with oil, I tried flipping the crepes on an electric stove, but was not very successful as the crepe did stick to the pan. Any advice or tips? Thanks much. Um, you know, the first thing is you want to make sure that that, that uh, steel pan is really, really well seasoned. I have found that it requires multiple seasoning attempts to get it really seasoned. Um, so the typical way I would do that is I would put some neutral oil on it. I put it in the oven at 300 or 350, um, let it cook in the oven, oiled, um, we, you know, nothing in it uh, except, except the oil for an hour or two, and then turn the oven off and let the oven cool completely. And then you might want to repeat that two or three or four times. And I really find that that's kind of what it takes to do a proper seasoning um, in that kind of a pan. And then when it comes to your crepes, um, the electric stove might be part of the issue. Um, they're not always known for having the most even heating. So in a crepe pan, if you have hot and cold spots, you might have uneven heating, which would definitely cause an issue with how it sticks or doesn't release. Uh, but certainly I would say, you know, check to your, your crepe batter, make sure that you have, um, you know, enough heat on the pan. I would say a lot of people don't heat their pan enough. And that's probably the big, the big issue. Um, and just give it, give it another shot. Uh, next question. Hi, Chef Ken. I'm almost done. Three activities to go. It's been amazing. Fantastic course. And I relish the comments that extractor provide when marking. My confidence is boosted and the world of ingredients and techniques have been opened up to me. Thank you from Lisa Ann. Uh, well, gosh, thank you, Lisa Ann. You just made my day. Um, I'm really glad that you've gotten a lot out of the course and that you're more confident. That's so much the main goal of what we're trying to do is to just increase the frequency of people cooking. How many times are you cooking? And um, how much joy do you have in cooking? What is your confidence level? What's the story that you tell about food because you like cooking? It's a much different narrative that we can share when you're a part of the preparation and the cooking process and then um, helping others with that. So really, really great. Thank you. Uh, next question from Heather. Do you recommend dehydrating foods? Do you lose the nutritional value of fruits and veggies when you dehydrate them? Um, you know, Heather, I would say there's probably some um, diminishment in nutritional value 
really um, in that dehydration process, I would say it's going to be fairly minor overall and something that wouldn't prohibit you or uh, dissuade you from doing it. Um, lower temperatures are going to be generally better in terms of nutrient retention. I would also say that, of course, the most important thing is to start off with the highest quality possible product, and that's going to be the best thing in terms of uh, what inputs you're going to get. Um, I would also say that, you know, when it comes to using dried vegetables and dried fruits, they just have a lot more concentrated flavor and they add a lot to a dish. So, you know, I made um, last night for dinner, one of the things I had was just ba very, very basic white beans with porcini mushrooms and dill. Um, and I'll just say that, you know, uh, there's just something in that where there you get a lot of satisfaction. Um, there's a simplicity to it. And um, the flavor from those porcini mushrooms, because they were dehydrated to start, is what made that dish. Um, so something really simple with that flavor boost with those dehydrated mushrooms was was really key. And you get a similar you know, boost of flavor by adding dehydrated um, you know, carrots into a, a soup or dehydrated shallots into a, a recipe. You're just going to get a lot of uh, concentrated, a lot of depth. Um, so absolutely, I would say it's a great thing to do. It's going to also be a way to just preserve what you have. So if you go to the farmer's market at the store or your backyard garden and you want to preserve those products, you know, dehydrate it. I just got done dehydrating a ton of, of mint from my garden because, you know, I wanted to harvest, dehydrate, and then I've got dried mint for tea and everything else for the rest of, of the next year. So it's really, it's really great. Um, next question here about cooking beans in the instant pot is difficult. Um, timing wise to get the right texture results, firm, but not tough on the outside, soft on the inside. They're either too mushy or too hard. Does cooking with onions change timing? Uh, yeah, I would say cooking with anything is going to change the timing a little bit or change the ability for some of those products to, um, you know, to soften. I would say that the best thing to do is to really follow um, the basic guidelines and take notes. So, for instance, every time I cook beans in my Instant Pot, I just keep a little pad and pencil and write down what happened. And if you look at those notes over time, you'll see the trend is that, you know, maybe you overcook certain things because you added too much time or you undercook certain things. For me, the big variable is not just the timing or the cooking under pressure, but it's that sitting time afterwards. And I've actually built into a lot of my Instant Pot cooking um, this notion that I'm going to maybe cook it under pressure for 14 minutes, but then I'm not going to release it for 30 it's going to sit there under pressure, hot, continuing to cook, right? It's still cooking time, even though it's not, um, you know, maybe under full pressure. So it's those sorts of things that I like to experiment with um, or giving it a quick, uh, you know, low simmer to evaporate some of that liquid off and to maybe uh, concentrate some of those flavors. So those sorts of things that you can actually do to, um, to make that bean cooking a little bit better. But, you know, I would say... Yeah, it's a little bit trial and error. Um, even something as simple as like black beans, every type of black bean, depending on where it was grown or how big it was or how it was harvested can have different, um, you know, different cooking times. So a lot of variation in there. Uh, next question, if I'm using my chef knife on a daily basis, how often should I get my knife professionally sharpened? So, you know, Darlene, it really depends on, um, you know, how you treat your knives. I would say if you're using your knife all the time and you're also honing it all the time, you might not need to sharpen it more than you know, maybe once or twice a month. Again, depending on what you're cutting and how you're cutting, um, you don't need to get it professionally sharpened. You can get a whetstone or a knife sharpener and do some of that work yourself too, but certainly sending it off to a service is one way to know that the job is being done. Um, so that's great. Good for you. Uh, do you salt your uh, bean soups at the beginning of cooking or add salt after the soup is done? So Austin, I actually salt um, partial way through. I don't salt at the beginning. 
I really want as much as possible for those beans to cook just kind of on their own to begin to swell and to get those um, starches softened. And then when I'm about, you know, halfway or 60%, then I'll add some seasoning. I'll add some salt. I'll add um, some other things potentially into that to make it more of a soup versus just plain, plain beans. But I don't tend to salt a lot. I like to salt uh, maybe midway um, and then really leave the rest of the seasoning for the final presentation of the dish. Because again, I'm not sure what I'm going to be doing with it or who I'm going to be feeding with it necessarily. I just don't want to have it to be um, too salty or um, unnecessarily salty. Next question. Hi, Chef. I'm currently doing the plant-based course. Is following this plant-based course enough to start a professional cooking career? Or is it just to have knowledge as a home cook? Um, you know, the professional plant-based course has certainly been used by people in that professional space. It provides a huge amount of knowledge and um, competency-based instruction that I think you can definitely translate into a professional mode of working. I would say that it's not the completion of the course that gives you that opportunity or the, the knowledge and the skill. It's really your own internalizing of the information and understanding it and being able to practice it. So um, I always caution people because it's not like just because you completed it, you get the, um, you know, the automatic stamp that you're a chef or that you can do it. You actually have to show and prove that you can do it. So that's the more important piece. <coughs> Excuse me. Next question here. Um, how long do pine nuts last in the fridge or is it better to store them in the freezer and plan ahead for cooking them and other nuts? So I would say either way, you're going to be better than having them uh, stored, you know, just on your shelf or above the range or something like that. So you want to keep nuts and seeds when you can keep nuts and seeds uh, cool or cold. So if it's in your freezer or if it's in your fridge, they're both going to be better. Uh, I would say generally, if you're looking at like storage times, you know, three to six months is probably the the upper limit of when you're going to want to be able to, to use those and cycle those out. <clears throat> uh, hi, Chef Ken. I agree with Lisa Ann about how valuable this course has been for me. I love the videos and the woman's voice is so calming. The opportunity to feel free to ask any questions is a wonderful format. Thank you. Uh, well, thank you, Carol. I'll let... Um, Dawn, our, uh, our our voice talent and our co-founder of Ruby, actually, I'll let um, I'll let her know that you like her voice. It's also her hands in the video, so you see a lot of Dawn's uh, hands and her voice uh, throughout. Um, thank you again. Really appreciate those kind words. Next question: When cooking desserts, can different types of flour be substituted without major problems? For example, almond or wheat flour. Um, almond for wheat flour, excuse me. Um, well, certainly I think that, um, you know, when you're thinking about desserts and you're thinking about functionality of the ingredients, um, you can't just take flour out and put any other type of flour in and expect it to work the same. So even whole wheat flour still has gluten. So it's going to operate a lot differently in terms of the texture, the hold, uh, and those sorts of things when you compare it to an almond flour. So I would say when you're doing a recipe for the first time and trying substitutions, um, you know, you might want to look at, you know, doing a 50-50 type of a thing or really finding a recipe that at the beginning is an almond flour recipe. So in other words, don't, you know, turn some other recipe into an almond flour recipe. Just find a recipe that uses almond flour to start with. That's going to probably give you um, a little bit of a better uh, option. Uh, hello, Chef Ken. Uh, I have a jar of truffle paste close to expiry date. Please give me some ideas to utilize it. Uh, question two, I also suggest a four to five course sample menu plant-based for fine dining. Well, um, well, gosh, the truffle paste could be used in that four to five um, uh, course fine dining menu for sure. I would say for the truffle paste, man, there's a thousand things to do with that. That would be so fun to play with that. You've got options. You've got um, a lot of flavorful uh, surprises with the truffle paste for sure. Um, you know, simple things to do are, you know, uh, just adding it to 
a beautiful soup to finish a soup. So if you have a, a cream of mushroom soup that you've made with mushrooms and maybe some cashew cream to thicken it up, um, you can use that to just kind of finish it and add a beautiful uh, truffle flavor. If you're making little, um, you know, little flatbreads or little crostinis, little appetizers, um, those can be used to flavor, you know, uh, anything, white beans or some mushrooms themselves, even um, any other vegetables can really benefit from that. Uh, you can use it in a, in a vinaigrette. Uh, you know, you can think about how you add that to something, <clears throat> even like after roasting. So you roasted some sweet potatoes or you roasted some cauliflower, um, you know, thinking about that flavor being added would be really wonderful after. In terms of a multi-course, I always like to start with uh, salad. You can also do a cold or hot soup. Salads can be, uh, uh, you know, different kinds of salads, composed salads, uh, grain salads, leafy green type salads. Um, really just think about what's seasonal. Uh, soups, I like to also have really lots of small plates for people. So I don't really think about courses necessarily, but really just how many different options do people have. So the thing for me is always to have lots of different uh, flavors and textures, you know, small things that are maybe more piquant or pickled that people can add. Um, things that add texture, um, all those sorts of things just make eating a lot, a lot more fun. Next, I would agree with Lisa Ann. I'm 95% complete with the course and obtained so much valuable information that it helps me sustain the whole food plant-based lifestyle. We have been on now since the end of February. I started cooking forks over knives then, and this has been perfect. Thanks. Thanks, Peggy. Next question. Hi, I'm on task 421 flavors with tempeh at this moment in Columbia. We are in mandatory quarantine and imported products like tempeh are not available. How can I substitute this ingredient without affecting my final grade? So, you know, if you want to just, I guess, two options, one would be just to hold off and just to wait and see, you know, for the next weeks or, or month or two, if it's available to you. Otherwise, um, you know, you might just use something that you can get. If it's, uh, you know, if there's any products that you have that you can substitute, even just tofu, just to go through that that activity, it doesn't at all cook the same, of course, much, much different product. Uh, but otherwise, I would just say hold off maybe and just see if you can wait to see because it is an important learning outcome and tempe is, um, you know, pretty unique in that way. Um, next question, why is gelatin important to stock? Does it enhance flavor? or there are other uh, desirable characteristics we get from it. So when you're talking about conventional cooking, um, you know, animal protein-based cooking, gelatin is an, a natural product of, um, of making that product. And it's really more about the texture and the way it feels or reduces versus the flavor. There's actually no flavor in gelatin. The flavor is gonna come uh, from the other products that you're working with. Um, Cynthia has a question. Have you ever used black cumin to season? Yeah, black cumin seeds, delicious. Uh, there's all different kinds of wonderful, um, you know, types of uh, spices and seeds out there that just add an amazing uh, depth of flavor. I like using black cumin seeds um, just very, very lightly used with some fenugreek um, and a little bit of turmeric with my roasted cauliflower. That's one of my really delicious uh, cauliflower recipes. It gets finished with some squeezed lime and some fresh cilantro leaf at the end. But black cumin is one of those things that a little bit has a lot of flavor. You don't wanna go overboard on it. It can be a little bit bitter uh, if you go over on it, but it does have just an amazing um, complex uh, warming type flavor. Next question, how do you clean the plastic ring on your Instant Pot, does it affect the food if it smells like garlic? Yeah, I would just say, Carla, one of the things I do with my Instant Pot lid is I take out that ring, I'll um, soak it in very hot, soapy water, even just take a kitchen scrubby to it. You wanna make sure that there's no um, residue or starch or anything that's kind of built up in there. It's a easy thing to forget about and one that I think can actually impact um, the flavor of your food potentially. 
I have used the no-knead bread recipe that requires 12 to 18 hours of rising time. Um, I was told if I add a half or a quarter teaspoon to the dough, the rising time would be reduced to four hours. Why? Um, not sure what half a teaspoon is. If you're adding um, half a teaspoon of salt, might retard um, the, the, the amount of time, which would actually increase but I'm not sure what you're adding to the dough. Um, you know, typically a no need, you're going to want to have a nice long ferment, even an overnight ferment, as the 12 to 18 hours would indicate, um, because of flavor, because you're going to get a lot more flavor development with an overnight um, colder ferment, like in the fridge, even. Rutabaga from the store has a heavy wax coating. Those I bought fresh from the farmer's market doesn't, with fresh ones... Uh, leave the outer skin on to cook or remove. Um, I typically um, take the outer skin off of a rutabaga. Um, you know, many cases, the rutabaga, the exterior skin can just be a little bit tough, the way kind of a, a beet skin might be a little bit tough. Uh, but it's totally up to you. Um, if you want to scrub it down and uh, cook it up, and if it's palatable, nothing keeps you from eating that. Uh, but don't eat the waxy one, of course. I'm currently out of the country and do not have readily access to some of the ingredients. Uh, what's the best way to determine substitution? So Sandra, if you look on the task itself that you're uh, inquiring about, um, click on the questions and support area. If there have been questions on that task about substitutions, that's likely gonna be the best place you can look. And if you don't see anything there, you can of course reach out to us. So please always feel free to contact us directly, uh, studentservices at ruby.com. Just let them know the specifics. Hey, I'm working on this task, uh, you know, task 381 in this course or whatever it might be. And let them know what it is you're trying to cook and what substitutes, uh, what substitutions you'd like to make. And uh, someone from our support team We'll either answer it directly or maybe pass it along to one of our chef instructors uh, who can definitely help you take care of that. Um, good afternoon, chef. I'm a secondary culinary instructor. Wanted to thank Ruby for providing the sanitation course for free. Um, teachers really need resources like that for, for next fall. What are the chances? So um, great question, Lincoln. I'm not sure what's going to happen in the fall. I can guarantee it's not going to look like quote, regular school <laughs> or something that we would have uh, in the past been accustomed to, but I don't know what to expect in terms of, um, you know, students being back in the classroom or if it's a split schedule or uh, limited class size or what that might look like. Um, yeah, the course would still be free though, for sure, uh, next fall. Um, Next question here. I was interested in using the faba butter mentioned as an alternative in recipes, um, but can't seem to find it anywhere. Do you have any suggestions? Uh, Laura, I am actually not sure where to find that. So if you want to contact us directly, um, student services at ruby.com, uh, we can hunt that down for you or find you that reference. Uh, hello, loving the course. Question, is there a way to neutralize tomatoes to make low acidity pizza sauce? Uh, so Deborah, interesting question. You can choose, um, you know, one option would be to find some lower acidity tomatoes. There's some varieties of tomatoes, certain varieties of yellow tomatoes, for instance, that just have lower natural acidity. Um, and those might be, you know, perfectly good for you to use I would say otherwise, um, you know, if you're worried about the, the pH of the tomato sauce, um, you know, there's not much you can do, I would say, kind of naturally other than, you know, adding some, some base, so, something that is the opposite of acid to your sauce. But you could really risk kind of messing with your flavors and things if you start adding uh, baking soda and things like that to your sauce. Um, I would just say from a flavor perspective, though, um, balancing the acidic flavor, you can add something that's a little bit sweet. So um, depending on whatever your your base sweetener might be, uh, just a very, very small amount of sweetener, uh, a teaspoon or two in your tomato sauce might be enough to um, change the flavor to be less acidic on your palate. 
Uh, so hopefully that's helpful for you. Looks like that is all we have for today for questions. So wonderful. Thanks again for taking the time to join us today for this Ruby live event. It's uh, always a pleasure to uh, answer the questions that you have. If you feel like I didn't get to your question or if there was a question that I answered that wasn't thorough, please do reach out to us directly. We're always happy to dig in a little bit deeper uh, and support your needs. Uh, so until next time, we look forward to seeing you in class and happy cooking. Take care.